After the First World War, some nations successfully seceded from the former Russian Empire. Unlike Poland, Finland, the Baltic states, Ukraine did not achieve independence. Why was that? In this video, you're going to learn about why Ukraine failed to achieve independence after World War I. In the previous video, I talked about how four different Ukrainian states saw the light of day in the year of 1918. After the February Revolution, the Ukrainian Rada was established and declared itself loyal to the provisional government. Yet, after the October Revolution, they declared themselves independent as the Ukrainian National Republic, the ONR, also known as the Ukrainian People's Republic. Local Bolsheviks set up their rival government in Kharkiv. The UNR managed to get recognition by the Central Powers. The Bolsheviks did capture Kyiv, but in February 1918, the Central Powers moved into Ukraine and the Bolsheviks signed the Brest-Litovsk Treaty, therefore recognizing the UNR. Yet, in April, the Germans installed a new puppet government led by Pavlo Skoropadsky. When the Central Powers were defeated in the First World War, the Germans left Ukraine as well as Skoropadsky. The UNR was re-established, meanwhile, in the West, in an area called Eastern Galicia, former Austro-Hungarian territory, the West Ukrainian People's Republic was proclaimed in Lviv. And in this video, we're going to take it from here, from the end of 1918, and we're going to explain to you why Ukraine failed to achieve independence. Now, this is a fairly complicated conflict, also known as the Ukrainian War of Independence, involving many different parties, sometimes fighting against each other and sometimes joining forces to fight other parties. Brace yourself. The Soviets did not want to let an independent Ukraine happen. And a big reason for that was the fertile lands of the Ukraine. It was known as the breadbasket of Europe. But there was more, as historian Laura Engelstein puts it. The Ukrainian lands belonged to the Slavic core of the empire with a closely entwined history, a similar peasant culture, the same predominant orthodox religion and a similar Slavic tongue. On the 12th of November 1918, actually one day after the end of World War I, Bolshevik leader Leon Trotsky ordered the Red Army to invade Ukraine again. One week later, a second Ukrainian Soviet government was established, this time not in the city of Kharkiv, but north of it in Kursk. The Bolsheviks were tasked by preventing the Ukrainian nationalists that were led by Simon Petlyura to gain ground, but also to repel the white Russian forces led by Anton Denikin that came from the south. And then there were also the French that were part of the Allied intervention force that had landed in Odessa in December 1919. At the start of 1919, the second Soviet conquest of Ukraine started, where they captured Kharkiv, Chernigov and Poltava. The Red Army was led by Vladimir Antonov Ovsenko. On the 16th of January, the new Ukrainian government, known as the Directory, declared war on Soviet Russia. The Ukrainians, they reached out to the French in Odessa, but the French didn't want anything to do with them. They saw Patliura as a bandit that needed to resign at once. The French did support Anton Denikin. The Ukrainians had many units that defected, some to Denikin's army, many peasants to the Reds. The Red Army took Kyiv on the 5th of February and the Directory fled to Venezia. In March, the Reds took Nikolaev and Kherson. Towards the spring, the Red Army arrived at the gates of Odessa, where 50,000 French, Greek, Romanian and White Russians were stationed. On the 2nd of April, the French, who suffered bad morale, decided to pull out and the city was taken by the Reds, as Antonov Osenko declared. On the 6th of April, Odessa was taken by the Ukrainian Soviet army. The supporters of the Allied imperialists in the Black Sea have crumbled. Long live Soviet power. Long live the World Socialist Revolution. In southeastern Ukraine, the Reds enjoyed the support of the anarchist Nestor Makhno, 
who had organized the local peasants into a successful force, the Revolutionary Insurgent Army of Ukraine, with 50,000 men in its ranks mid-1919. At its peak, they controlled an area with a population of almost 2.5 million. Magna's goal was to organize a movement that would not replicate government institutions, but would promote the self-activation of the laboring masses. And the Reds needed the support of the Blacks, because the lines of the Bolsheviks were severely under strain. The Whites, led by Denikin, captured Lugansk on the 5th of May. The Bolshevik government in Moscow was facing threats from three directions. From Kolchak in the east, Udenich in the north, and Denikin and rebelling Cossacks in the south. That summer, Denikin's forces moved towards Moscow. In August, they entered Kyiv together with the Ukrainian Galician army. This was the army of the West Ukrainian People's Republic that was driven out of the area by the Poles. Later, Denikin forced the West Ukrainians to leave and proceeded with anti-Ukrainian measures in the capital. The Directory of the UNR rejected the Whites and Petliura came to terms with the Poles. Denikin's advance came to a halt thanks to the actions of Magnus' army and on the 16th of December, Kyiv was taken by the Reds for the third time. In May 1920, Poles and Ukrainians captured the city. However, their lines were overstretched, and due to a Red Army counterattack, they had to pull back. Mid June, the Reds took the city again. They eventually turned against the Blacks of Nestor Magno. Magno himself got away to Romania. Petliura got away to France, where he was assassinated in 1926 by a Jewish anarchist named Shalom Schwarzbacht, who claimed that Petliura was responsible for the countless of pogroms that took place under his rule. Now, this is a debate. Some argue that Petliura did try to stop the pogroms. Others claim he didn't do enough. If you have any thoughts on this, leave it in the comments below. But what were the underlying reasons why the Ukrainians failed to achieve independence? According to historian Orlando Fages, the Ukrainian nationalist movement had largely collapsed by the year of 1919. And that had to do with the fact that the territory of Ukraine had switched hands so many times between 1917 and 1920. Kyiv alone changed hands 12 times in that period, but there were more reasons. Until the end of the 19th century, the idea of an independent Ukrainian state had existed mainly in Shevchenko's poetry and Cossack myth. With the exception of the western Ukraine, where the landowners were mainly Poles, the mass of peasants remained untouched by the intelligentsia's nationalism. See, most of the Ukrainians were peasants, and most of these peasants, where they cared for was the independence of their village. And abstract concepts like a nation state, well, didn't resonate with them. Now, socialists from the Ukrainian Rada did try to explain it to them. However, actions were absent. Promised land reforms were never carried out, and that's why a large portion of the Ukrainian peasants didn't want to fight for a national cause. And also within the Ukrainian nationalist movement, there was division. Division between nationalists like Petli Yura, who subordinated social reforms to the national struggle, and those like Vinichenko, who subordinated nationalism to social change. The urban head of the Ukrainian national movement was thus cut off from its rural body. What remained was a local peasant nationalism, focused on the idea of the autonomous village, which continued to dominate the Ukraine, making it virtually impossible to rule from the cities until the early 1920s. This passive nationalism hindered the Bolsheviks a lot during the first two invasions of Ukraine. The Bolsheviks responded with terror, and as a result of this, there was a whole series of peasant rebellions against the Bolsheviks, of which the rebellion of Nestor Magno was the biggest. When the Bolsheviks came around for a third time, Lenin insisted that his comrades had to be more sensitive 
to the national sentiments of the Ukrainian peasants. As Lenin wrote in November 1919, we must find a common language with the Ukrainian peasant. And as a result of this, many peasants found common cause with the Bolsheviks, not with the whites, not with the Ukrainian nationalists. Ukrainian culture would therefore flourish in the 1920s, and Ukrainian language became a respected language for the Bolsheviks who used it as a tool for propaganda. During the 1920s, it spread its domain into schools and offices, street names and shop signs, Soviet documents and insignia, party congresses, newspapers and journals. More Ukrainian children learned to read their native language in the 1920s than in the whole of the 19th century. Eventually thus, the Bolsheviks gave in and gave room for Ukrainian culture to flourish. This would eventually come to an end when Soviet dictator Joseph Stalin rose to power. Thanks to my patrons, you see their names on the screen. A special thanks to Liam Devlin, Damien Wallace, Connor, Philip Jordan, Jakob Mosland, Nick Terranova, Haley Mark Lil Hill, Janusz Dojemkiewicz, Joan, Justin Turbell, Tanya Dixie, Henry Clarkson, Rob Park, Andrea Martic, Susanna Di Bella, John Beach, Luis Pichiera, Fernando Lopez Ojeda, and Mike West. If you like to learn why the Poles defeated the Ukrainians in 1919, you can click right here. And um, if you're interested in videos about Ukrainian history, well, I have a playlist for you. It's right here. I want to thank you for watching. Don't forget to subscribe and I'll see you later.